Good Tuesday morning, everybody. It's Pastor Rob here. I hope you had an amazing uh, Veterans Day, and I want to thank everybody for their service. Thank everybody for our freedoms. And, uh, you know, anyway, just want to say thank you for your service. I hope everybody had a great Veterans Day. Celebrate your veteran. Uh, what a privilege to serve our nation, and uh, we're grateful for all our freedoms. So, uh, yeah, let's get into our 50th Bible study lesson today in the book of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 14. We're in the last week of Jesus' life. This is going to be the scene in Gethsemane after the upper room. He finishes a meal with his disciples. It's his final night, Thursday night. Jesus takes a trip from the upper room across the Kidron Valley over to the Mount of Olives Garden of Gethsemane. And he's uh, basically here's where he has his prayer and he takes the sin of the world onto his body in this moment. Very important moment. And I, this was one of the few uh, portions of scripture where I really, really looked into the Greek. It's really fascinating what the Greek says here, what happens to Jesus during his uh, time in Gethsemane as he prepares to go to the cross. Final night, he'll be arrested this night. And he will be tried all night before he's crucified on the cross uh, Friday Friday morning. So let's go uh, go ahead and look here. Mark chapter 14, verse 27. Uh, he's finished the meal. He's had communion with his disciples. And it says, uh, verse 27, you will all fall away. Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Here he goes, quoting Zechariah 13.7, a prophetic verse about Jesus Christ's uh, betrayal, uh, trial, crucifixion. Uh, so it's I like these prophetic verses where he ties the Old Testament and the New Testament together. It's often thought in the New Testament times, the church age today, that we don't need the Old Testament. And I can't stress enough that everything in the New Testament finds its value its foundation and everything within the Old Testament. So we need both Testaments. So, uh, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now, Peter, here comes Peter again. He's always the first one to talk. And he says, even if everybody falls away, I will not. Now you think of that statement, knowing already what Peter's going to do, betray him three times. Uh, and that's just interesting that Peter even says that. It's a very bold statement in front of the company he's in. But that's Peter, always open in his mouth and not a fault, just a characteristic of Peter. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, uh, today, yes, even tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. But Peter insisted, so he's arguing with Jesus at this point. He does this a lot. You know, he tries to keep him from going to the cross. Jesus has to rebuke him. Uh, Peter later on will cut off the uh, ear of the high priest's uh, servant. And here he is arguing with Jesus right now. Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. So all the others agreed. We won't, we won't betray you. won't betray you. Uh, I think of that too, like in military times, if something got bad or when I was a police officer, so many people say, oh, I don't care how bad it gets. I can, I can, I can gut it out. I'm not going to be afraid. And then I remember first time we did some house clearings and how many guys were really nervous and even one guy we had uh, wouldn't even go in uh, home with us when we were clearing it. So anyway, just some interesting stuff. And yeah, you really don't know uh, some uh, often when you get into a situation how you will perform. Some guys do. They're, they're natural. They rush into trouble. Police officers, soldiers, EMS guys, fire guys, you know, they're, they're, their heart is to rush towards the battle. And many guys are tried and true. But in this case here, Peter really doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't understand what he's saying. And I love that when Jesus is on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We have no clue. Peter has no clue. And oftentimes we have no clue what, how we're going to behave in a situation until it happens. So this is what Peter's saying. And apparently all the others agree with him that even if they had to die, um, they would they would not betray him. So <clears throat> anyway, just a thought there in, uh, in the upper room. And then they head across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem down to uh, Gethsemane in verse 32 they went to a place called Gethsemane which is olive press a place where olives were ground into oil uh, very symbolic of what is about to happen to Jesus Christ he's going to be ground down as a human his blood is going to gush out as uh, a payment for our sins we brought we brought our sin 
he took it on him. He was sinless. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He who knew no sin became sin. And so that's what Jesus is. He's sinless. He's perfect as he can be in the flesh. And he is going to take on our sins. That sin is going to destroy him. It's going to crush his body. He will be utterly crushed for the human race. And so that's why the title or the name Gethsemane is important. It's all of press. It's crushing olives and the oil comes out just like Jesus' body would be crushed. Uh, and so and um, so they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, "Sit here while I pray." So you're gonna go to you're gonna go to war with me. You're not gonna betray me. But this is interesting because he says, "Why don't you just wait and watch with me?" Making it very easy for them, and they can't even do that. They can't stay awake long enough to uh, to watch out for Jesus while he's praying. Let alone uh, go to death. Uh, go yeah to, to go to death for him. So he took Peter, James, and John. Here we go. Uh, Peter, James, and John are Jesus' inner circle. I think it's always very important that you have an inner circle in your life, people that you trust, two, three people. I always use the biblical perspective and uh, do what Jesus did or uh, basically have three people you trust in your life, accountability partners, men, women you can talk to, men and men, women and women, and uh, and just uh, you know have some people you can confide in. It's nice to have some friends you can trust talk to. I have many friends that I talk to about the Bible. I can bounce things off of them. And even if we don't agree, we can discuss them freely. And I think it really helps us have a broader mind or perspective on the Bible. It's very difficult and arrogant, actually, to think that you have every possible perspective on any scripture ever written in the Bible. So it's very important to have other people's input. Very important to have people's um, uh, accountability, protection in a group. You're stronger. You know, three cords are not easily broken. So he takes Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to become deeply distressed, troubled, and overwhelmed. Now I want to concentrate on those words today in verse 33 of Mark chapter 14. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed, troubled, and in verse 34 he says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow even to the point of death. Now I found that interesting way back a few years ago, and I said, well, what do these words really mean? Why is Jesus, the Son of God, in his hypostatic union, going into a place of prayer where he's going to meet his Father, and, but he knows the cross is coming. We know that. He knows the cross is coming. But how does he become distressed, troubled, and overwhelmed? Well, he's about to experience something he's never experienced. Number one, uh, the wrath of God is going to be poured out in his body for our sins, something that he did, a crime he did not commit. He's going to be deeply distressed, deeply troubled, and overwhelmed because of our sin. He's experiencing, number two, a thing that he's never experienced in his life, and that is sin. He doesn't know what that is. He knows what it is, but he's not experienced it. He's not given into it. He's, he's been tempted many times. Hebrews is very clear, just like we all are tempted. All men are tempted and uh, he, without sin. So he's tempted like we are. He can identify with what we go through, which is why it's important that we understand who Jesus is. We have a Savior who knows what we go through. A Savior that's experienced what we've experienced, and so on. So we can talk to him on common ground, uh, just like uh, we had Veterans Day. It's great to get around soldiers when you're a former soldier or whatever your background is, and talk to people who can really understand what you did as a military person or woman, you know, man or woman in the military. It's, it's nice to have common ground. Well, our Savior has common ground with us. He experienced all things like we do every day. If you've been tempted, if you've had a situation, you can guarantee Jesus also was in that situation. And we can go to him boldly and talk to him about that because he loves us and he does want to have a relationship with us. So these three words are very important. And I wrote these down, so I have to read a little bit. And I looked these up. He takes Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane. They still go a little way further away from the disciples and Jesus begins to pray. But before he gets there and begins to pray. He's deeply distressed. That word is ekthambastii. Ekthambastii. Forgive me for not being able to say it properly, but he is greatly awestruck. He's looking at this and he's amazed. He's astonished and he's out of his senses. And we're going to see why that is here in a second. He's distressed. He is ekthambastii, amazed, astonished, and out of his senses. Why? Because he's about to take the sins of the world on his body and carry them to the cross. Sin that he's never experienced. It's not his sin. 
It's our sin. And God is going to allow that to happen so that God can pour his wrath out upon his son uh, because of that sin. Remember, the devil did not send Jesus to the cross. Our sin did and God's wrath did. So he was making payment for crimes he never committed. So Ekthan Besai, he is uh, amazed, astonished, and out of his senses as he sees the sins of the world coming at him. This is what he sees. There's a spiritual realm. There's a realm we don't, we cannot see, but Christ could. And that is he can see the sins of the world all around him coming upon his body. So he's deeply distressed. And it says he was troubled. What does that word? Adamonian, Adamonian. His soul is trying to free itself from the intense pressure the body is under. His soul is trying to free itself from the intense pressure the body is under. Here is a sinless man, Jesus Christ. He knew no sin. He resisted temptation. He sees the sins of the world all around him coming upon his body. He is distressed and he is troubled. As the sin comes upon his body, it is so powerful. Sins from all time, all time, past, present, and future sins upon his body. It crushes his body so badly that the soul wants to escape from his being. So he's deeply distressed, he's deeply troubled. Uh, so this is Ekthan Bastai, amazed, astonished, and out of one's senses. And he is troubled, Adamonian. His soul is trying to free itself from the intense pressure the body is under. What is that intense pressure? The sin entering his body. And so it says he is deeply distressed, deeply troubled. And then Jesus says in verse 34, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He hates sin. He doesn't sin. He's distressed. What's he distressed over? Well, number one, Jerusalem didn't recognize him. Number two, none of the people recognized him as Messiah. Very few followers understood who Jesus really was. And then he sees this sin coming upon him, his sorrow, the sorrow of sin, the sorrow of rejection. Uh, he had really no no fame, real fame. We just had followers, you know, that really, uh, he was very popular, but people really didn't understand who Jesus was. So he's overwhelmed. And the word here is perilupos. In other words, the perilupos means there was trouble all around him. He's being betrayed. Uh, as you know, the Judas is going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. The priests want him dead. The government wants him dead. My Herod and Pilate become friends because they have a common enemy in Jesus Christ. They want him dead. All these things are happening. Not only that, but now he's about to take the soul, uh, excuse me, the sin of the world on his body as he knows he's only going one place, and that's to the cross. And if you read about the accounts of going to the cross, what happens to men as they face this possible punishment or death on a cross it says some people got so weak at this time they would collapse they would lose bodily function this is a horrible horrible death and jesus knows that's where he's going that's what he came for he's never experienced this but he knows where he's going and it's going to be it's going to be traumatic beyond traumatic <clears throat> so he's amazed and astonished out of his senses his soul is trying to free itself from the intense pressure the body is under because of the pressure of sin and wrath of God is coming upon his body. And then he's overwhelmed with perilupos. He sees trouble all around. He is greatly grieved, sorrowful to the point of death. He's experiencing something he does, does not want to experience. He's doing it willingly on behalf of the human race. And for the first time, he's going to have separation from the Father because of sin and he's going to be filled with sin, <clears throat> something that he never experienced until he took our sin, <clears throat> excuse me, upon him. And in Luke 22, another thing, we know you guys are very uh, familiar with this portion of scripture. Some of you may not know where it's at, but it's Luke 22, 43. While he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's experiencing these things. Luke uh, 22, 43 Obviously, Jesus is praying, and he's asking for God, if it be your will, take this cup from me. The cup represents the wrath of God upon Jesus' body. Verse 43 in Luke 22 says, An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And verse 44, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. This is Luke 22:44. He prayed more earnestly, and this is where we get the verse, 
and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So what is that? There's a condition called hematidrosis. Hematidrosis is when the body is so overwhelmed by pressure or stress that the blood begins to leak into the sweat glands of your body and come out through your sweat glands. This is what Jesus is experiencing. Pain all around, astonished, out of his senses, the pressure, his soul's trying to leave his body. The sins, our sins, past, present, and future are coming upon his body for all mankind from the beginning of history to the end of history, uh, to the end of time. All these sins are coming upon his body and his body is breaking down under the pressure to the point where the sorrow and the pain and the stress are beginning to cause his blood vessels to burst, pour into his sweat glands, and come out through his body. <clears throat> that's hematidrosis. That's Luke twenty-two, forty-four. if you want that verse. And so I just really was looking at this. You know, this is, again, Thursday night. He finished John chapter 13 through 17, the Upper Room Discourse. He's finished um, eating with his disciples. It's his final meal. He's going to pray in Gethsemane for all of us, take the sins of the world on his body. He's going to be arrested, and he's going to be tried and go to the cross. He'll be tried all night, by the way. And so he's he's just so stressed, blood is coming through his sweat pores. He, so he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Telling his disciples that just told him, sorry, that just told him, we'll die with you, die for you if necessary. Now he's just saying, just stay awake and pray for me. And they can't even do that. How it just shows, by the way, and you should have no trouble with this, that we are so weak. We are so frail in our flesh. We think we're tough, but we're not. And basically that we can't even stay awake or these men can't even stay awake to keep watch for Jesus for just a short time. We think we can do so many things, but it shows how helpless we are and how important it is that we understand we need a savior. Jesus went in on our behalf. He took punishment we deserve. He went to the cross, a place we deserve to go. And he took our place on the cross. And so uh, he became sin who knew no sin. That's up, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 again. <clears throat> so my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he said to him, stay here, keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground. He's overwhelmed. He, he's the sin is just destroying him. Of course, we know the devil and the demons want to attack him. He's at his lowest point here, even more so than when he fasted for 40 days. Uh, and that's in Mark 4, Luke 4. So going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed, if possible, that this hour, remember I said before, this hour, there's time periods in the Bible that are very important. And they're usually this hour, this time is a very specific point in history that is significant to the sovereign timeline of God. This hour, this hour would be him going to the cross. Take this from me. So he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. This moment, this crucifixion might pass from him. Abba Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Everything. Please take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will but what you will. Jesus is going to be perfectly obedient to the Father. And he says, if you can take this from me, and wouldn't we all pray that? Take this pain from me. Well, I'm sure we've all prayed some sort of prayer like that. Take this pain from me. Take this moment I'm going through, this hour that's troubling me when our kids are sick, our loved ones are sick, when some, something traumatic happens. God, help me through this time. Please take it away. And that's what Jesus is saying. But he's in perfect obedience for the Father. And he knows that the father is not going to do that, but he's still going to ask. And he does. <clears throat> then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping again. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for an hour, a short time? Uh, in this very significant moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, the hour. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And I think that's a great statement. If you've ever been a soldier in the military, you know, we were in Ranger Battalion. We can do anything when we're 19. So in our mind, we think, I can go back and do that again. Or I can go back and play football again. Or I can do these things I used to do. The Spirit's willing. But we realize, and the great Jerry Rice said, he would have played football forever except his legs gave out. You know, over time, you get old. Over time, you can't do the things you used to do. And so the Spirit is always willing but the body is weak. And, and so these guys were willing to follow Jesus. 
willing to stand by Jesus, but they're realizing how weak we are in the flesh and how important it is knowing that to lean on the strength and power of Jesus Christ outside of our flesh. We need him. We need a savior. He's not a crutch. He's, you know, he is certainly someone there to help us. I hear people say, oh, Jesus is your crutch. Well, that's not necessarily true. If I was going to have a crutch, though, it would certainly be him and I'd be grateful. But I would tell you this, it's, it's much more difficult to lean on Jesus in this world today than it, than it ever has been, uh, except maybe at the beginning of the church. But if you're going to have a crutch, let it be Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you, you've got to be a lot stronger these days to be a Christian than not be one. And so um, I hear that often. But then he returned to the disciples, found him sleeping, and talked to Simon. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation, which he's going to in a few minutes. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And so once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back again, he found him sleeping. That would be me. I'm sorry, man. I have trouble staying awake at night, so I'd probably be crashed out too. Because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. And so uh, returning the third time, he said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Okay, that's enough. The hour has come. There he goes again with the hour. He says it three times in this chapter, in this portion of scripture. The hour has come. The time has come. This moment from the beginning of time, 1 Peter, uh, 2, 1 Peter 1, 20, uh, Titus 1, 2, all these times in the past where he, he knew he was coming here. Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, he's coming to do this very thing. His sole purpose for coming to the earth was to go to the cross and redeem the human race. All the other things he did are fantastic. But this hour that he came for is literally to go to Calvary. And so this is where he's at. The hour has come. This moment has come. He knows it's coming. He knows Judas has betrayed him. He knows the guards are on their way. And he's about to go to the cross. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. But remember, in John 10, nobody takes Jesus' life away from him. He lays it down. So he knows this is coming. This is his moment in time. It's what he came for. And he's very aware of what's happening. Nothing is catching him by surprise. And he's telling the disciples, look, here comes my betrayer. He knows who that is. That's Judas. He knows what's about to happen. He's going to be arrested and tried. And he's going to be taken to the cross. So we'll stop there on verse 42. That'll be lesson number 50. Remember these words. Ekthambastai, Adamonian. Perry Lupus, Jesus was distressed, troubled, and overwhelmed. And I'm sorry for the sorry for the light. Distressed, troubled, and overwhelmed. Um, because he sees the sin of the world coming upon him in Gethsemane. He's going to take this sin to the cross. He's going to go to the cross, die for our sins. He's going to receive the wrath of God, not the wrath of Satan, not the punishment of Satan by any means. Satan is not even in the picture on this one. He's going to go to the cross in obedience to his father. The father's wrath is going to be poured out upon Jesus Christ. Why? Because of our sin. And he's going to then later uh, be buried for three days, take his blood to the, to the mercy seat of heaven and pay for our sins uh, with his blood. So that's our, our study for today. I hope everybody has a great day. That's Jesus in Gethsemane, um, Mark chapter 14. So we'll see everybody tomorrow.